Okay, you have you must articulate the answer in words written on paper. Chris. Chris, come here. Organize this a little bit. Organize this a little bit. Okay. Right here. Stack it to where it's not so jacked up. <coughs> Throw all these away in the garbage can outside. Okay. <laughs> I've seen a lot of blank papers that all they have is more warm up on the top. Discussions that have nothing to do with Griffith and his experiment. Okay, guys, on task.
but the instructions are floating around. The instructions wiggle their way into the harmless bacteria. And then this harmless bacteria, which is intact and alive and has the capability to produce protein, starts to read that DNA. Okay, in a process that we're going to learn about next, protein synthesis, and then starts producing proteins that are harmful for the mouse. And when it incorporates DNA from another organism, that process is called transformation. And in my AP Bio class, right, we're going to transform E. coli bacteria by adding jellyfish DNA to it. And then that bacteria will start to produce jellyfish proteins and it will glow in the dark. It becomes fluorescent. So that process where an uh, organism starts producing proteins from another organism because you put DNA inside of it, it has become transformed. Right? Now, that's what Griffith's experiment concluded. I'm putting together your Schoology quiz as we speak, and it's going to be posted by the end of the day. And you guys are going to have to understand what Griffith's experiment concluded, and also what Avery's experiment concluded. Okay? Avery's experiment dealt with taking the stuff that came out of the harmful bacteria and separating it, purifying it into all the different components. Yes? How we're past this, right? Go back. Go back? You have done no slides at all? So you guys did, no, you guys should, should be way farther than this. We just started like right We got help So in the margins, you should put what did Griffith's experiment conclude. On the margins, you should put what did Griffith's experiment conclude. There was another. When I, I need your guys' attention for the next 20 minutes until I finish this, okay? Because I'm not going to ask for it, okay? It's just going to be given. If I'm lecturing about Oswald, Avery, and Alfred Hershey, and complimentary base pairs, if I'm mentioning all these things, and this is completely like foreign and new and just confusing and over your head and all these words, like you've never seen them before, what that tells me is that you did not do the reading assignment that was due last Friday. The point of assigning the reading assignment is so that you can go and actually read the stuff that we cover in class. If notes and my lecture are the only time that you're going to be coming into contact with this information, you're never going to do well in this class. If you just copy and paste and, and uh, somebody else's homework that they finished and you just copied and pasted and submitted and you did nothing, it does fine. You're like, yay, I cheated the system. I got my free 10 points. Cool. Well, guess what? When you take the test, you're going to be clueless and you're going to get an F or a D. But you got those 10 points, which are worth boop, on your grade, and then you flunk the test, which is like <laughs> on your grade. Congratulations for not reading the two pages worth of information, right? Uh, I'm stressing that if, you have, if you're struggling with the concepts, and you care about your grade, read the reading assignments. If you're struggling with the concepts and you don't care about your grade, hey, keep on chucking the way you're doing. Just chug along, right? Because you'll see that. So when I talk about these guys and I get this blank stare, I'm like, you guys, I just looked and I saw like 20 people turn in their homework assignments. And they're like, I've never heard of this before, but it was in the reading. Well, I didn't read. But how did you do the homework assignment? I just copied it from a friend. You think I actually read the homework? <laughs> Out of your mind. I'm like, oh, okay, well, cool. Well, maybe you should probably start doing the reading sentence. Because that sure is telling like a popcorn read in class. <laughs> yes? Uh, we don't have a package. Okay, then you need to print it out because I ran out of extra copies for the people that I did. Okay, so Oswald Avery did this experiment right here. And you'll see this diagram in your school test. Mark. Yeah. 10 students? That's at, at once? Um, so what he did is he broke down all the different <laughs> macromolecules that were in the smooth because they wanted to find out what that transforming material was. So they used a process, he used a process to separate the RNA that was inside of the bacteria. This is the bad bacteria that they heated up. Proteins, the DNA, the lipids, all the fat molecules, all the carbohydrates. Yeah. So, so what happened was it, it just mixed the RNA with the rough bacteria, it did not transform. If he just mixed the proteins, the lipids, the carbs, no transformation would occur. But when he separated the DNA from the smooth and he mixed it with the rough, transformation occurred. 
So what he did was he narrowed down what type of molecule was that, that transformation material. He wanted to test it, so he added enzymes, specific enzymes called nucleases, proteases, lipases, right, and amylases that would break down the different types of molecules. When he broke down all the proteins with proteases, transformation still occurred. When he broke down all the lipids with lipases, transformation still occurred. But when he used nucleases, an enzyme, that, think of it like it's just a, a, a DNA destructor. When he added nucleases with those extracts and it chopped up all the DNA and he mixed it, the bacteria would not trans transform. It would not become bad. So he narrowed down which of all the different molecules was the transformation molecule. So this was the conclusion from Oswald Avery. So we've talked about Frederick Griffith, we've talked about Oswald A Avery. Now we're going to end with talking about a partnership between two individuals, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, otherwise known as the Hershey and Chase experiment. Somewhere else off in the world at around the same time that everybody else was trying to figure out what DNA was all about, these guys dealt with these little viruses called bacteriophages, which inject their DNA into bacteria. The bacteria reads the DNA and make copies of the virus, and then the virus bursts out, killing the bacteria. It's kind of how all the viruses work. Viruses specifically attach to unique cells that they're kind of shaped perfectly to bond to, and then inject their genetic material into that cell and force that cell to read that genetic material and make more copies of the virus. Sometimes the viruses can just make their way all the way into the cell, like with HIV. Now this is a virus, a very specific type of virus that's shaped like this. It's called the bacteriophage. Phage meaning eat, and it kind of eats or kills or destroys bacteria. It has two components. The outside body, which has this kind of cool alien snake-like shape, and then this squiggly stuff on the inside, which is the DNA. Sometimes it's RNA inside of a virus. For the most part, viruses are proteins out on the outside, DNA in the, in, the, in the middle. And the DNA is the instructions to make the outside. So think of like a cardboard robot walking around, and if you open it up on the inside, are instructions on how to build that cardboard robot. Okay? But the cardboard robot can't make copies of itself. It has to like hijack these factories and then sneak its instructions into the factory's normal instructions and they start building the evil cardboard robot. So what <clears throat> Hershey and Chase wanted to find out was, was it the protein that got injected into the bacteria or was it the DNA? Because they didn't know, but they knew that viruses were made up of those two things. So they performed this experiment where they used radioactive isotopes, radioactive atoms, to label the two parts of a virus. Because viruses have contained two parts, a protein shell and then genetic material on the inside, which is either DNA or RNA. So they, on the top experiment, they grew a batch of viruses using radioactive sulfur, which is the atom S, sulfur. This radioactive atom, when they built the viruses, acted kind of like a tracking beacon. We could follow that protein wherever it went because we produced these viruses with this radioactive sulfur material. So inside of this Erlenmeyer flask, a bunch of viruses are being made using this radioactive material. And so on the outside of the virus, the, the protein part, there's radioactive sulfur. So then they mixed it with bacteria and they allowed the virus to infect the bacteria. They put it in a blender and shook it so that the viruses kind of let go of the surface of the bacteria. And then they went and put the, whole, the solution in a centrifuge, in a test tube that went in a centrifuge, which just spun around and spun around. And all the cells went to the bottom, and the solution that had all the viruses that got shooken off are on the top. And then they simply traced to see where did that radioactive material go. Because if the radioactive material went into the cells, you'd see radioactivity right here. If the radioactivity stayed on the protein shells of the virus, then it would be up here. What they noticed was that the radioactivity never went into the cells. So it wasn't the proteins that were being injected. So they, they wanted to see if it was the DNA, so they used radioactive phosphorus. Now in DNA, there's a, a molecule called phosphate group which contains the atom phosphorus. So they are putting a, literally a tracking beacon on the DNA. And so they grew a bunch of copies of these viruses, but they put this tracking beacon on the DNA, not the protein and they infected the bacteria, and they shook it around, and the viruses let go of the bacteria, and when they put it to the centrifuge, 
they noticed that now there was radioactive material inside of the cells. So they concluded that it was the DNA, not the protein, that contained the genetic material that was inserted into the bacteria that caused the bacteria to produce more copies of the virus. And this is how viruses work. This is a, an actual electron microscope picture of three bacteriophages that are on the surface of an actual E. coli bacteria cell. So if I were to take a transmission electron microscope, which is a two-dimensional image, not a three-dimensional image, of these tiny little molecules. Now this bacteria cell is huge, right? It would have been like compared to the virus. So if this is a bacteria, right, an E. coli bacteria, your virus would be this tiny little speck that would land on the surface that would inject its DNA inside of here. And then the ribosomes of the bacteria cell would read the DNA and just start building viruses. So Ebola, flu, the cold, hepatitis, that's how it works. You got a virus inside of our body, it starts latching onto our cells, forcing our cells to make copies of the virus, killing the cell in the process. And now we got copies of virus that spread and then infect the neighboring cells and you get sick. Your symptoms of a virus depend on the cells that are being destroyed that are copying the virus. So if you have HIV, it's white blood cells that are copying the virus, and you have a lowered immune system. If you get Ebola, right, it, it affects a lot of different types of cells, and you just kind of start bleeding out. If you get hepatitis, it affects your liver cells, so you have liver function. Uh, if you have like a herpes sore, right, it affects your skin cells, so you end up breaking out like a blister. Uh, the cold, rhinovirus, it affects your respiratory tract and the cells that line your sinus cavity and your lungs. That's why you cough and sneeze and you're congested. If you get the flu, it affects your gastrointestinal tract, like your esophagus and intestines. That's why you get sick, you want to vomit, right? So each virus has its own special target, and that's how you get sick. And while that virus is making copies of itself, your body is learning how to kill it and destroy it by creating antibodies from its white blood cells. And during the time that you're sick, your body's just trying to learn how to kill it. And then when your body goes out there and destroys the virus and all the, and all the cells infected, then you get better and you should be immune to any subsequent exposure to that virus. So I'm going to start putting these checking for understanding questions at the end of each Roman numeral in your notes. Now I'm not going to ask you to answer these questions, I'll just fly by really quick, but you're going to be expected to stop, think about what I just lectured about, talk to your partners at your table, and then I'm going to stop and I'm going to call on five or six people to answer the questions using the wheel of death. So, and if you weren't paying attention or you didn't discuss amongst your partners, then, you know, when I call on you, you just don't look like an idiot. But question number one was your warm-up. Griffith writes, what did he conclude? That there was something that went from one bacteria into the other and transformed it. Question number two, what was that? Well, we concluded that it was DNA. The reason why we did that is because of Avery's experiment. Question number three, how did he conclude? Well, he destroyed everything but the DNA and it still transformed. But when he destroyed the DNA, it wouldn't transform the harmless bacteria. How did Hershey and Chase determine? That was that experiment with the viruses and the bacteria where they radioactively labeled each one. And then lastly, um, the phosphorus labeled the DNA and the sulfur labeled the uh, protein. So I want to show you really quickly Hershey and Chase's experiment. In the Hershey-Chase experiment, bacterial viruses called phage were used to demonstrate that DNA is the genetic material. The phage used in this experiment consisted of a DNA molecule surrounded by a protein coat. When phage infect bacteria, they attach to the surface of the bacterium and inject the DNA into the cell. The protein coat remains on the outside of the cell. In the first part of the experiment, Phage were produced in a medium containing S35 radioactively labeled amino acids. This resulted in a phage population with S35 labeled proteins, but no radioactive label in the DNA. The phage were then allowed to infect the bacteria. The phage attached to the bacterial cell and injected their DNA, but the radioactively labeled protein code remained on the outside of the cell. The phage produced in these cells contained no radioactivity. Vigorous shaking caused the empty protein coats to be removed, but did not interfere with production of new phage in the cell. In the second part of the experiment, phage were produced in a medium containing P32-labeled deoxyribonucleotides. 
This resulted in a mage population with P32 labeled DNA, but no radioactive label in the protein. When the phage infected the bacteria, the P32 labeled DNA entered the cell and could be found in phage subsequently produced in the infected bacteria. This demonstrated that the DNA, but not the protein, carries the genetic information for a new generation of phage. Okay. So we're going to do a couple slides and then we're going to do an activity where you're actually going to put together and build the structure of a DNA. And I have an extra credit assignment if you guys want 25 points extra credit. We actually build a three-dimensional model of a DNA molecule that looks like this. This is what some former students of mine. Yeah. Uh, pass over there. Uh, where they actually have to build a, you know, a model and then have a key that labels all the different components of the model. Now, I have very specific as to the things that I want you to show. I want you to show that it has a double helix. I want you to show the sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate back pump. You must show that the nitrogen bases branch off the sugar, not the phosphate. You have to have at least nine nitrogen base pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think they have nine. Minimum nine. You have eight, so we do Okay, but nine will give you a good twist. You have to show the purines and the pyrimidines. Um, we'll talk about what those are in a minute. Show the type of hydrogen bonding in between the base pairs. And most importantly, you must show the base pairing rules. That across from an adenine nitrogen base pair will always be a thymine, and across from a cytosine will be a guanine. And you'll see that today when we do our cutout ex uh, activity today for the rest of the period. That you should be able to finish most of it today if you're not completely off task. Oh, so when I say this is going to be on the test, it's either going to be on an online test or it's going to be in your chapter test. So if you look behind me, the very first component of the very first part of this note explaining about the structure of DNA is that DNA is a long polymer made up of monomers called what? I just put that question on the online DNA quiz. This is a DNA model. These are paper clips. This is one paper clip. This is a mono paper clip. Because mono means? So this represents a monomer. When I start to put paper clips together, I start to make a polymer. So I have now connected four paper clips. Notice that the DNA is a long chain. Look at how I, right? A long chain of repeating units. Okay? This is one polymer. But in fact, DNA is not just a single polymer, it's a double polymer. It has two long chains, right? That run in opposite directions of one another and that are complementary and that kind of match. So if I build another polymer, look, on one side is this guy who's kind of twisting, on the other side is this guy who's kind of twisting. They match across from one another and they form this double helix. The paperclip or monomer represents a three-part structure. So I had a student last period who kind of made a point that I never really thought about. A nucleotide is the monitor, the monomer. It is composed of a phosphate sugar nitrogen base. My fingers are touching the nucleotide. He's like, if it's made up of multiple things, why is it called a monomer and not a polymer? Because poly means many. He said that's a great question. But look at the repeating unit. Phosphate, sugar, nitrogen base. That is one nucleotide. Phosphate, sugar, nitrogen base. Another nucleotide. Phosphate, sugar, the nitrogen base fell off here. Phosphate, sugar, nitrogen base. Nucleotide, nucleotide, nucleotide. Same thing here. With this, okay, we have a phosphate, sugar, and nitrogen base. My finger is touching three things, right? That's a nucleotide. If I move down, another nucleotide. It has nucleotide, 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 nucleotide. So the question is, what are the repeating nucle uh, monomers in DNA? They're called nucleotides, and they have three parts. You guys are going to be building these things. Let me grab some good ones. You guys are going to be making these. Right? Except do me a favor. See how this student like taped them like where they're they're touching? Leave a little gap in between the nitrogen bases. So let me show you the nucleotide. Okay, I'll start right here. 
Phosphate is the cross. Sugar is the purple kind of pentagon. And then across from it is the nitrogen base. That's one nucleotide. Below it is another nucleotide, a nucleotide, a nucleotide, a nucleotide, a nucleotide. And up going the opposite direction is going to be the complementary nucleotides that match. Across from adenine is thymine, and cytosine is guanine. This is a person that started building their DNA model. This person just started putting together the sugar phosphate backbone first. And then they were going to add the nitrogen bases to each sugar that branch up, and that's fine too. But this is what we call the backbone of a DNA molecule. I'll show you another example of somebody who's done or close to being done. Here's somebody who's just started right here, okay? They just started up top, and then this guy's gonna go upside down the opposite direction, right, like this. And notice that there's stars right here, and there's stars on the phosphate, they overlap when you glue. And there's circles right here on uh, this end of the nitrogen base. There's going to, uh, I'm sorry, the sugar. There's going to be circles on the uh, nitrogen bases that you overlap and glue too. So it's all kind of coded. So you don't have to really think too much in terms of what goes where. It all kind of makes sense. My biggest pet peeve, though, is crap like this. Just Let's just leave those scissors right there. Because that's clearly where they go, right? Instead of like the scissors holders that I have. Uh, there's um, colored pencils in the back right there. I got colored pencils that are on the desk, on the floor, in the front, on the sides. Is this where the colored pencils go? No. There's these tiny little colored pencil sharpeners that go with that whole Crayola, Crayola kit. They are sprinkled throughout the entire like, classroom and I have to chase them down. This sort of stuff infuriates me. Infuriates me. Because what you're saying is like, eh, Mr. Vero, pick it up, right? Put it back where it was so that I don't have to go around behind you like your maid cleaning up the room. That sort of stuff infuriates me. So please, don't do that. Got it? When you do your extra credit, for those of you who love extra credit, notice that some between two, some nitrogen bases you have three hydrogen bonds. Between others you will have two and you must show that if you want full extra credit. And I will show you which ones those are. On the margin of these notes, please write the question that you'll be asked on the test and in the online quiz. What are the three components of a nucleotide? And they are a phosphate group, a five carbon sugar called deoxyribose, that's why we call it DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and then any one of four nitrogen containing bases. Not nitrogen, because nitrogen is one atom. Does this look like a molecule made up of one atom? Look, look at it. That whole molecule, and there's four types, is a base, the opposite of an acid, and it contains nitrogen. This is just a graphical representation of this. Right? Both of these are like the same thing. Sometimes it shows like this in a textbook, this is a much more complex textbook that actually shows you the atoms and their bonding relationships. So at first, when scientists studied our DNA, they thought that maybe we have equal parts adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine, which are the four parts, the four different nitrogen bases. Until a guy by this name, Erwin Shargoff, was studying different species of DNA, and he found something interesting. James Watson went and saw this guy speak, wrote down some notes, I think on like a napkin, came back and talked to, to his uh, partner Francis Crick at the local pub, and as they were talking about the structure he, he brought, brought up, he said there was this guy, Erwin Shargoff, and, and what he saw is that whether you were studying bacteria, yeast, which is a fungus, fish, humans, birds, doesn't matter. If you, if you look at the DNA inside of their cells, and you analyze the percent of that DNA that was A, C, T, G, you always notice some relationship. So look at his data. These numbers represent <coughs> percentages. So they should all add up to around 100%. By looking at this, what do we notice in terms of any sort of trends or patterns? So look at it, maybe talk to your partner, okay? And if anybody notices a pattern or a trend, <laughs> Raise your hand. So look at the data that's up here. 
I can easily call on people too and have you tell me what's the pattern in the trick. Yeah. What's the pattern or the trend that's shared by all organisms? All. Sam. Uh, a and T seem to be more common than G would say. That's one pattern. There's typically more A and T's than C's and G's in this in this small portion of data. That's not necessarily always true, but that's definitely with this piece of data. Good. Good observation. What else do you observe? It's a very simple four numbers. <laughs> you don't have to be, it doesn't, the trend doesn't have to be exact. It could be rounded, you know, it could be about, approximate. Mm -hmm. Eve. It doesn't matter if you get it wrong. Science is all about getting things wrong and trying to get. Twenty or thirty. Which ones round to twenty and which ones round to thirty? Okay, that's an important trend. These two are typically pretty close to each containing thirty percent. So there's about thirty percent adding and about thirty percent thymine. That means that they're almost equal parts adding and thymine. And there are about twenty percent guanine and twenty percent cytosine, meaning that there are equal parts cytosine and guanine. He didn't know why, but he saw this in all DNA. There's usually about as much thymine as adenine and cytosine as guanine. So he came up with what's called the Chargaff rules. That A equals T and C equals G. Now he didn't know the structure of DNA, so he didn't understand why until Watson and Crick, and he's playing with his little cardboard. Remember the video when he was putting together his little cardboard uh, manipulative oh, yeah. model? And then all of a sudden it's like, poo! Right? When he put together, you remember that? When they like the. Yes, he's like, I didn't want to wait for the lab to make my models out of 10, so I'm just going to cut it out of cardboard. And when he put the A across from the what? Yes. T, it matched. And there was hydrogen bondings. Adenine, when he cut it out, is a larger double ring structure. It looks like this. This is adenine, this is this nitrogen base. It falls under the category of a purine. Now, thiamine, which is a single ring, falls under the category of a pyrimidine. And across from adenine, you'll always see a pyrimidine. They match. They're, they're what we call complementary base pairs. And that is the most important thing about the structure of DNA. And across from cytosine is guanine. Okay? So one of the things that you may want to put on the margins here is, what is Chargaff's rule of state? And also, which, which uh, bases are purines and which bases are pyrimidines? Across from every purine has to be a pyrimidine. So what you end up seeing is Watson and Crick finally figured out that on the outside of the structure were sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, but facing in, branching off of the sugars, were these adenine and thiamine, cytosine and guanine nitrogen bases. And across from one, if, if this structure was had an adenine across from it, this is just sign yourself, this one over here had a thiamine. If this one over here had a guanine, the other one had a cytosine. If you look at this, if you show this picture to anybody who's ever taken any science class or science major in college, they'll tell you right off the bat that that's Watson and Crick's famous discovery of the three-dimensional double helix. And that's Watson, he's the American, and that's Francis Crick. Right, he's the British guy. That's a famous photograph. Famous. Very, very famous. So I want that to be a familiar photograph for, to you guys, right? Because this is considered one of the most important scientific discoveries in the last 100 years. Without understanding how DNA works, because you need to know the shape to understand how it works, we wouldn't have genetic engineering, we wouldn't have GMOs, right? We wouldn't have all the types of things, uh, genetic research to, uh, for evolution, uh, for evolution uh, area purposes, uh, genetic research when it comes to like studying cancer, things like that, all spawned off of this. Rosalind Franklin was one of the few people in the world that had mastered the technique of X-ray crystallography. She would take x-rays, literally, of tiny molecules, like 
DNA. Well, DNA is a long molecule compared to other ones. VR. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Franklin would take x-rays of tiny little molecules and when you, it's very hard to get a molecule to you know, stand still to be able to, to shoot x-ray at it and then be, produce an image that you can read. And so she was one of the few people that, that, that can work this uh, highly technical process. And if you get this image, to most people you're like, oh, I don't know what that is. But to the trained eye, this type of image, when you shoot x-ray particles, you know, like energy towards that molecule, it causes this diffraction pattern that only a helical shaped structure would form. So someone with, you know, trained in, in chemistry and physics could know, would know that only a helical structure would create that pattern. And so Watson and Crick saw that picture and, and, and from her data helped them understand that DNA must have been helical. Even though that information was extremely important in the discovery of the helix, she did not get the Nobel Prize. Although Maurice Wilkins, uh, who she worked with, did. Uh, she kind of got snubbed, probably because her and Watson didn't get along at all. Uh, she died early from cancer. Um, but since then, she's been kind of getting a little bit of love and a little bit more credit uh, for that uh, important discovery. This was the, the um, article that they published in April of uh, 1953 in Nature Magazine uh, when they came out with the discovery that DNA was a double helical structure with the nitrogen bases facing on the inside, adenine with thiamine, cytosine with guanine, and the two strands were complementary based on Chargaff's rules, meaning that a cross from adenine was thiamine, a cross from cytosine was guanine. So cytosine complements guanine, and adenine is complementary to thiamine. So that forms this structure that you guys are going to be putting together in just a moment. The backbone is this right here, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. And in the middle, branching off of the sugars, is this cytosine, guanine, adenine, thymine, nitrogen base. And the base pairing rules are very important. And what you see from this diagram right here, what's across from cytosine always? What's across from adenine? What's across from adenine? So notice this right here is the nitrogen base. That over there is the phosphate, and this over here is the sugar. That one structure right there, that whole thing, is a nucleotide. These are what type of bonds right here? Nope. Hydrogen bonds. Are they strong or weak? Trace, put away your cell phone. Huh? They're weak. They have to be weak. Otherwise, this molecule would not be able to unzip when it's time to copy or make genes, or make copies of genes. Between A and T, there's two hydrogen bonds. Between C and G, we have one, two, three hydrogen bonds. So you guys are going to be doing the untwisted version of DNA when you guys do your cutout model. Got it? Okay, so I'm going to give you guys about three minutes, based on what we just lectured, in pairs, right, to the left, to the right, in front, behind you. Go over these six questions, and I'm going to call on you guys. Have the answers. So if I call on you, have something to say, it better be right. All these answers are in your notes. You better be right. No, don't just be like, uh, I don't know. What about four minutes?
a bow, that refers to the sugar in the nucleotide, nucleic acid, because the whole molecule, this whole thing, falls under the category of a nucleic acid. So does RNA. So the D refers to this guy, the sugar. What are the four nitrogen bases that create the base code? CTAG. What are the names? Yes. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. Yes, cytosine, adenine, thymine, and guanine. Correct. That is the name of what does Shargoff's rule, Erwin Shargoff's rule, state? Caitlin? Shargoff's rule? So I can't hear you. What? What are you saying? Remember when we had, we looked at that chart, right? And it had yeast, bacteria, herrings, humans, right? You just use the letters. Don't even say the word. If you're, if you're stumbling on the word, don't worry about it. What did he conclude? Looking at the numbers. What was his rule? Right? <laughs> Call on somebody else. <laughs> What's Shargoff school study? A equals T. C equals G. Look right up here. The reason why that is, is if I have a DNA strand that's a million or a billion of these long, across from every A is a T. So if you have, you know, if 60% of it is A, or 30% of it is A, then 30% will be T, because they're across from each other. And for every, across from every C is G, uh, is, that's a typo. Got it? They equal each other, because they are directly across from each other in their structure. That's Shargoff's rule. <laughs> which of the bases are purines and which of the bases are primities? Hazel. You don't know. What was my little, uh, did I tell you about ag? Agriculture? Okay, the way that I remember the purines is I, A and G are the purines. And they say, the, you know, they spell the word ag. Which is kind of an, an abbreviation for agriculture. When I think of agriculture, I think of things growing from the ground as being very pure, right, from the earth. So I think of ag as pure, purines. And so the other two are perimides. Across from every purine has to be a perimide. So in your extra credit, when you guys do your model, you're going to have to somehow exhibit which one are purines and which ones are perimides. In this student of mine, she used little beads that she got at like Michael's probably, and the larger beads were the purines, which made sense because they were actually larger molecules that had that double ring structure. And the smaller rings she used as perimides. And that was all, that was all, that was all laid out on, on the key. What? Question? A and G. They are bigger, correct. No, it does in the sense that like A and G are purines, and across from every purine has to be a primity. So A purine, T primity, right? G purine, C primity. You, you, two, two purines won't go be across from each other. Two primities won't. A and G, there are only two. There's four nitrogen bases. All right, let's go. Okay. okay. All right, so what is the overall shape of a DNA molecule class? 
Yeah, if you say helix, that's fine, but it's a double. Double helix. And the name of the book that James Watson wrote about the discovery of the DNA is called the double helix. Because this is a helix, and there's two of them wrapped around each other. And lastly, I'm not going to get into it. Oops. Right here. When they published their paper in 1953, they stated that the two strands were complementary. What does that mean? If you can, yeah, what does it mean? Oh, that they fit together and they are opposite. So when we say they are opposites, what does that even mean? How do you describe their opposite nature? Yes. One, go, one travels in this direction, the other one travels in that direction. That still doesn't describe the term complementary. How? How do they fit together? What does that mean? What goes together? Which ones and how? A and T and C and G are complementary to each other. So adenine's complementary base pair is thymine. That's going to be a matching question on your school G quiz. It should be easy stuff. Now, everybody turn around and face this way so you get your instructions because I'm only going to tell you once.